But today we're in Mark 8, and we're verses 1 through 21. 1 through 21. So if you'd open up your Bibles, um, please follow along there. Take notes if you can. Bring them to the open table. Send them to me. I don't want anyone leaving here without having a, a good understanding of what we read today or a good application for what we read today because the Lord does have something for you, each and one of you today, and it may be in a different way. So let's open up to the word of the Lord, Mark 8. Hear God's word. During those days, another large crowd had gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way, because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, But where is this remote place? Can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. Jesus gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. After he had sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus, to test him. They asked him for a sign from heaven. But Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation ask for a sign. Truly I tell you, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got into his boat, and crossed to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, Is it because we have no bread? <laughs> Aware of this discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember, just a couple chapters ago, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke seven loaves for the four thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. Jesus said to them, do you still not understand? The word of the Lord. Now I've titled this uh, sermon today called Beware. Beware. There's a few different things that are very important for us to pay attention to today and be aware of. Mark 8, coming out of Mark 7, which we talked about Jesus making this big arc, going through Gentile areas and arriving back in Galilee, his home area. Mark 8 puts us directly into a story. Puts us directly into another Jesus picnic. You can hear the ringside bell as this chapter starts, as the disciples enter round two in the Jesus Mathematics course. Now, what does it mean when I say Jesus Mathematics course? What is the equation we learned in Mark 6, verses 30 through 44? The main thing we learned there was, here's the equation. Whatever you do have, which is frankly not that much, plus the hands of Jesus equal more than enough. Okay, we learned that in Mark 6. The disciples learn that in a pretty clear way. So it's round two, and it's a very similar story. It follows almost exactly the same things. When Jesus tells us to feed the people, he will provide the means. 
if we put our faith in him. Again, this story, like I said, it follows the same way as it did in Mark 6. Jesus is teaching the people here for three days. That sounds like a tent revival, beloved. I love it. Are we ready to listen to Jesus for three days? Or more? That's just a side note. These people were interested in what Jesus had to say. They were not bored. They weren't forced to follow Jesus. The text says they once again had followed him even into remote areas. The people, thousands of them, valued the teaching of Jesus over their comforts, over concerns, disruptions, or lack of nearby proper restaurants. They had no care. Therefore, Jesus, seeing that they desired to be with him, it says again, he had compassion upon them. And once again, we get that word, splashniazomai, which is that Greek word, which is the, a very strong, guttural compassion. From the bowels he saw that these people were in such need, as I said last time, of a shepherd. He notices their desire to hear the words of life. As we learned in Mark 6, Jesus recognized that they need a shepherd. And our shepherd knows our needs. Jesus knows that people need to eat and drink. It's part of our human limitations. And he says that he'll provide for it. Even in Matthew 6, he said this, look at the birds of the air. Do they not sow or reap? Or store away in barns? And yet your heavenly Father, He feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? Jesus does not call us to Himself and then forget we have limitations. He will provide for us if we follow. Remember, Jesus does not do things halfway. He didn't bring them out there, preach to them for three days and said, See ya! Wouldn't want to be ya! You're probably pretty hungry, but I bought food. No, he feeds them. He does not do things halfway. Or un Jesus is never unprepared. He is not reckless. What did we learn in Mark 7 at the end of the chapter? He does everything well. Everything. Amazingly, though, the disciples in round two forgot the last miracle of Jesus feeding the crowds, or they didn't understand it. Again, they asked, where is this food going to come from, though, Jesus? Where, 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 where are we going to go? Literally the same question they had last time. Jesus again shows them the equation by asking for what they do have. And again, we see that all the people were able to eat until they were stuffed, satisfied, and there were leftovers. So today I'm not necessarily going to rehash the beauty of that miracle that we saw here and in 6. But rather, I'm going to follow where the text leads us in regards to this interaction with the Pharisees and the disciples' responses. The core of today's focus will come from verse 15 of chapter 8, where it says this. Jesus says clearly, beware, beware, be very careful, be aware. Jesus warned them, watch out for the yeast, the leaven of the Pharisees and not of Herod. Now he's using an image here, right? You know, the yeast, just a little bit of yeast can change a whole batch of dough. It can cause a whole patch of dough to rise. A little goes a long way. So I'm telling you, and this is important with the texts, anywhere that you see God Almighty telling us to beware, we best take note. We better be listening. What should we therefore beware of? And how does it translate to today? Well, I've identified three things, and we'll go through them. Number one, beware of those who always want to argue, but never listen. Beware of those who always want to argue, but never listen. When Jesus arrived in Dalmanutha, which this location is actually rather unknown to us today, it's likely on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, archaeologists believe. He was assaulted by old friends, the Pharisees. The Greek gives us actually a better understanding, once again, of their intent. The word for question in the verse here can be better understood as intentional or a formal debate. So the Pharisees, they were waiting on Jesus, and they wanted to have a formal debate with him, once again, or an argument. 
They've been prepared. You know, they've been getting all their docs and briefs put together. And the word for test can be better understood as actually legal or a trial. They wanted to put Jesus on trial. Let's have a little formal debate. Let's gather a little crowd and let's go at it. That was something common you would see. And that actually even extended from what was going on with the Greeks. The Pharisees were continuously looking to pin Jesus in with a new form of argumentation, code of ethics, or flow of logic. They were deeply, deeply hostile to Jesus. This hostility manifests itself in a demand, a demand for a sign, for a token, for a proof of his divinity. Their resentment, their jealousy, whatever it may have been, blinded them to the many signs Jesus had already been doing, clearly in their midst. Everywhere Jesus went, he was working miracles. Argumentation, beloved, don't hear me wrong, or asking questions, this is not on its face a bad thing. It becomes a bad thing or dangerous when we refuse to listen or humble ourselves enough to see what is right in front of us. When we cease to use debate or dialogue as a tool for learning, that's when it becomes a dangerous thing. Because then we're arguing for argumentation's sake. And where does that get us? That, that blinds us from what God could be doing right in front of us. So don't get me wrong. Dialogue is important. But when we debate in dialogue, it should be used as a tool to, to get to the truth. That's how Jesus used it. That's how he used parables, to get them to the truth. The scripture today shows us that Jesus was at his limit with such attitudes as this. The scripture says he groaned within his spirit. I, I don't know about you, beloved. I don't want to cause Jesus to groan in his spirit. Verse 12, Jesus was tired of this kind of response that lacked faith and doubted him and his words, refused to listen. The Pharisees refused to understand, to dig in, to search for the keys of the parable, to look at the words and even the actions of Jesus. Therefore, Jesus is not, you know, some of us may think that this is Jesus being impatient with them. No, it's not. He has been dealing with them for some time now. And he's frankly sick of it. He's over it. He recognizes that they have closed themselves off. They have perverted the whole batch of dough with their leaven. Remember, the Bible often talks about God's patience and that his patience is greater than any person or any man or woman. Anyone you may know, his patience is greater. And we know that to be true that we, because we're standing here, okay? Because this, this goofy pastor is up here preaching. That's only because of God's patience with me. Scripture talks about his forbearance, his long suffering. But nowhere in the Bible does it say that his patience is infinite. That's important. In the days before the flood, when the wickedness of men grew exponentially, God said, Genesis 6, 3, My spirit will not strive with man forever. Scripture plainly teaches us that there are limits to God's patience. He will eventually give us over to our sin, as it says in Romans chapter 1. This thought should give us pause. It should fill us with the fear of God. Which, as the writer of Proverbs says, is the beginning of wisdom. Be aware. Something like that handing over happened here. I do believe that. Jesus said that for asking for yet another sign, the Pharisees would be given no sign at all. What a terrible thing. Then he left them and getting back into his boat, departed from the area. He dropped the mic. Church, this should frighten us. This should sober us. Are we still waiting on yet another sign from heaven before we do the thing we know Jesus is calling us to do? What are we waiting on? Are the words of Jesus still not enough for you? Do you need more emotion, experience, more prayer requests met, more tithing, how long will we strive with God and His people? If we keep fighting Him, Jesus will get back in His boat and go across to the other side, to the other street, to the other church. Number two, 
Beware of those who insist on God to perform when and how they want. Beware of those who insist on God to perform for them when and how they want. Too often we think that if God does not answer us in our time or through the means we desire, he must not care or even exist. How often have we heard the story of the person who gave up their faith or didn't attempt to believe at all because God didn't heal so-and-so or help me in my time of need or get me the job that I wanted or save my marriage from falling apart. We always want one more thing from God to prove himself to us. We act like the burden of proof is on Jesus and we need to be convinced of his divinity. How absurd this really is in our constant search for more excuses not to believe we end up missing all the reasons to believe we say that again beloved in our constant search for more excuses like the Pharisees not to believe well of course you need to provide more tokens you need to do more miracles for us we end up missing all of the miracles we end up missing all of the signs that are clearly in front of us that allow us to believe, to see the glory of God. They're, they were so focused and had their eyes so on their feet and down and looking at their notes as to how they can pin Jesus that they missed Jesus literally putting his fingers in the ears of people and saying, be open. The very signs we desire are being displayed all around us, beloved. How petty we become in our arrogance and our bitterness towards God. Is not your every breath a gift? The fact that our hearts continue to beat at all? Is God not working all around us? Instead of the Pharisees recognizing that their Messiah had come, they developed a list of tests for him to jump through. Why do we do this? Why do we do this? I think it's because Jesus, he didn't come to pat us on the head, to you know, tassel our hair, to reinforce our social structures, to reinforce our laws, or give us a better life. He didn't come to keep us from spilling our milk. Jesus came to save us from hell, from eternal separation from God. We need Jesus. He does not need us. We need to beg our Father for, for the forgiveness that is offered to us and, and that He would simply not even reveal Himself to us in His glory lest we perish. You see, this you dance for me, God, attitude is a leaven. It's yeast. It's evil. It's prideful. Such an approach will spoil everything. This attitude has damaged parts of Christianity over and over again. This attitude has caused an emotionalism, signs and wonders, prosperity, and spiritual legalism to run rampant. And honestly, atheism. This kind of mentality has led many to an atheistic style of life. Because they have a whole wrong understanding of how God operates and why he came to save us. We cannot control God. We cannot demand a sign from him on our watch. The only way we will ever see the miracles of God is by faith. By not seeking Jesus for his glitz or the gleam or what he can do for me, but rather for his forgiveness and his precious blood, beloved. Amen? This is the greatest miracle that we will ever experience. The cross is the greatest miracle you'll ever experience. What we worship, what, you know, what we do in communion, the pouring out of the new covenant, those words, that's the greatest miracle you'll ever experience. It's life changing. Don't let the little things and our little ideas for God and how he should dance for us and what he should do in the signs and the hoops that we want him to go through. Let it get in the way of how his blood has been poured out and it's offered to you today. The greatest miracle you'll ever experience is offered to you today. Don't be looking down at your notes of what Jesus should be doing. 
Point number three, our final point. Beware of those who take Jesus for granted. Beware of those who take Jesus for granted. Now is the day of salvation, beloved. Today is the day. Not tomorrow, today. You don't know what tomorrow may bring. Jesus is here now. Looking at verse 14, the disciples began to freak out because they forgot some extra bread. After a huge feeding, right? Okay, so this is, this is hilarious, really. And Mark, of course, is putting this together for us. You can't make this stuff up, really. It's, it's too self-deprecating. <laughs> they had one loaf between the 13 of them, physically and spiritually. Mark puts these events together to show a powerful teaching moment. In a hilarious, hobbit-like dialogue, the disciples take the warning from Jesus as a passive rebuke. You know, Jesus just had this encounter with these Pharisees. He gets in the boat and you can see them paddling away. And Jesus is like, man, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. It's just, it's no good. And the disciples, meanwhile, are looking and they're like, should we let them know we forgot the bread? Ah, oh, this is all Thomas's fault. And then he says this thing about the Pharisees. And they're like, oh man, I don't know what that's about, but he's got to be mad. That, that thing back there, was that because of us? Dang it, Thomas. We're always getting us in trouble. Then Jesus, in amazement, slaps their foreheads together. Are you, are you talking about the bread? Did you not just see this? Wait, you're talking about the bread problem. Have, have, you, <laughs> have you not seen that the bread problem is the least of our issues? Then Jesus, like a second grade teacher, he walks them back to the previous events. So, so hold on, guys. When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of people... Wait, did you hear that? 5,000. How many basketfuls did you pick up? Uh, 12? Correct. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls did you guys pick up afterwards? Uh... Seven? He said that. Do you still not get it? Jesus is saying, where did that bread come from? How on earth did we get leftovers? You saw the measly amount of scraps we pulled together in the couple of fish. Do you still not understand who you're with? In a way, the disciples' view of Jesus was, a, was as faulty as the Pharisees. They still somehow treated Jesus as if he was just a rabbi. As if he was still a mere man or he was going to be a political revolutionary. And that he was unable to pull down heaven at any moment. You see, isn't this like us? We may be able to trust God with the big things. Sometimes that's easier. Like casting out demons healing the sick. But the day-to-day -day daily bread, that's a struggle. We act like this is our responsibility. <laughs> we take Jesus and his all-encompassing power for granted. We fail to trust or even recognize him in the small things. Isn't it ironic that the disciples were worried about their lack of bread and Jesus is sitting right there saying, don't you understand, John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, beloved, I believe that he's speaking on both levels. I think he's not only speaking spiritually, which is the most important thing, that you'll never go hungry or thirsty again, but he's speaking physically too. He's the provider. You follow me, you'll never be hungry and thirsty. I'll take care of you. I do all things well. Did they not say it? Praise God that he has compassion on us and the disciples, even when we fail to see his glory in front of us. Even though the disciples did not quite get it or understand Jesus fully, they continued to trust and they corrected, unlike the Pharisees. Clarity did not come fully to the disciples until the coming of his Holy Spirit. And the same is for you and I. The Spirit is teaching us even now and revealing truth to us at this moment. Therefore, we have a greater responsibility even than maybe the Pharisees or the disciples did, beloved. 
We have a greater responsibility because we know and we know better. And the Spirit is here teaching us. Do not test God's patience. Do not test God's patience. If you are hearing this word today, if anything is stirring within you, maybe even for the first time, I pray that you would receive God's mercy. You would lift your hand to Him. And you say, Jesus, cover me in your blood. I need you. Outside of you, I am dull. Therefore, I ask you again, is this good news enough, beloved? Is His word enough? Or are you still waiting on something more? Is the cross of Jesus Christ enough? Is His saving body and blood enough? Beloved, it's more than enough. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, I pray your word would take root in our lives and would guide us, each and every one of us, Lord. But your blood is enough. It's more than enough. It's our only hope. It is life, and it's life to the most abundant. Lord Jesus, teach us these truths today. Guide us in your word. Guide us by your Holy Spirit. And give us power from on high to boldly proclaim. In the name of Jesus, amen.